of all this horror it's a it's a horror of an episode like in every sense i feel like i completely disagree okay of all of the yin yang episodes <laughs> this is the one that i i handle the best because it's so clever it's like every moment it's it's clever i feel like the original the og the the first yang episode was so unique mm-hmm. and it had like mary says like like with yang there's a rhyme scheme there are rules um how dare yang ca- capture madeline like madeline being in danger was jarring but it's hard to not like watching yang because mm-hmm. she's because she has charismatic. rules. Like at the end of the day, Madeline Madeline was safe because they played the game. Like Madeline was safe because that, they figured like, it out. And so Yang followed the rules. Um, I agree with you. We're told people die. Yeah. But we don't see that happen. Right. I hate this episode because it demolishes me emotionally. <laughs> because Yin... Mr. Yin at the at the end of the day is a son of a bitch, Alexis, I agree. and I c- cannot stand by and let him exist. Yeah, he he. Uh, I think I think uh, Yang says it best, where she's like, "You thought I was crazy. You know nothing until you see Mr. Yin." Oh, she said, "Sick. You think I'm That's sick? It. You haven't seen anything yet." Yeah, and yeah. and Yin definitely does that. It's just a whole thing. It's a whole thing. We have lots of feelings. We have lots of needs to talk about in this episode. I say we start it. I guess it's showtime. This is... To To the the Blueberry! I am Alexis, and I'm a real-life Gus. I'm Kaylee, and I'm a real-life Sean. And together, we make up a real-life best friend duo who forgot how to do the intro to their own podcast. (laughs) We're trying to keep it fresh, and we're just ruining our own chances of success here. (laughs) Yeah, it's rough. Uh, We are doing a Psych Rewatch podcast, and today we are on Season 4, Episode 16. As we talked about earlier, Mr. Yin Presents. Which in and of itself is a Alfred Hitchcock reference because he had a show, a like a, a kind of a, a movie hosting thing called Alfred Hitchcock Presents. It was all the master of suspense, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I had no idea, but that is a good point. Everything about this episode is Alfred Hitchcock. Mm, I don't catch all any of the references probably. Except for the ones that I cheated <laughs> to find. So, Kaylee, you're, you're going to have to carry this. That's fine with me. I'm um, unfortunately a, a well-versed Hitchcockian. Is that a... I don't know. He was a, he was a son of a bitch, too. But <laughs> <laughs> that's neither here nor there. The man could write a suspense movie. It is 1989. Well, actually... Um, we, we start the episode with a last season on Psych recap, which I don't think we've ever gotten before. I don't think we've ever gotten one before, but I think we get them in the future, mm-hmm. and this is the beginning of that. And the recap was of um, the original Yin Mr. Yang episode, Yang. which An was called... Evening with Mr. Yang? That's it. And there we go. if you want to listen to that episode, go back and listen to it, or go back and watch the episode. It'll be helpful. Otherwise... We start in 1990, uh, nope, we start in 1989 <laughs> with little baby Sean, and he is being dropped off at the movie theater to see The Little Mermaid on a Friday night without Gus. Henry is very uh, confused, and Sean says that Gus has a fear of René Aubergenois, who does the voice for the French chef Louis <laughs> in, in The Little Mermaid. He is best known uh, for Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Oh. He's recognizable for many, many things, but uh, I, I know him on site, uh, Deep Space Nine. And um, he, Sean also says it's a Benson thing, and I didn't understand that, but Jody Benson does the voice for The Little Mermaid. I was very confused oh. by, by this rapid fire in the car with Henry. 
So <laughs> basically what I caught was that uh, Henry was kind of suspicious and he knows the runtime of the show and we'll be back in exactly 116 minutes to pick him up. Now this part confused us also. We did a little bit of um, gabbing about this. The actual runtime for The Little Mermaid is like 89 minutes or something. Yeah. It's like, it's not even an hour and a half. And we also see on the marquee on the other side that there is a Alfred Hitchcock um, movie marathon playing Psycho. And the runtime for Psycho is 109 minutes. So if Henry's going to be back in 116 minutes and little baby Sean can hustle and the start time is right, he can secretly watch Psycho. Now, is that what we think he does? Oh, yes. And I think that... He was being honest to Henry about Gus not coming because he was afraid. It's just that Gus wasn't oh. afraid of the French chef. Gus was afraid of Psycho, which I get <laughs> as a Gus. As a <laughs> Oh, man. We cut to the current, and we are at the current day Hitchcock Fest. And Sean is late and is squeezing between a bunch of people so that he can sit in the center of the aisle with Gus. Yeah, and Gus is mad because he missed the whole first third of the movie, but Sean is not mad because we're on the shower scene, and that's really the most important part. Wait for it! <laughs> and Gus seems surprised, taken aback even, <laughs> at this scene. And I was like, wow, he really hasn't seen it up to now? Yeah, what? come on. We get a walk and talk after the movie, and there's this comment made about how Alfred Hitchcock was obsessed with women's Japanese household slippers. Well, there's a very real piece of trivia that Alfred Hitchcock has a cameo in all of his movies, oh. which everybody knows, says Gus. But Sean comes back with... Obsessed with women's Japanese household slippers. Um, he even wears them to bed. That's not true. <laughs> it's a bit I'm doing called Random Creepy Untrue Trivia. Mary Lightly. As they see Mary. That's, that's it. That's the transition. <laughs> he's. Oh, did you catch the way he's holding his umbrella? He's holding the handle from the bottom with just his fingertips. Because he's <laughs> Mary lightly. Um, Mary just stops and goes, "You guys like pie." Everything about Mary is so weird, and and it's it's one of the things that I wanted to talk about because it's just timely to me right now. But my husband and I just finished binging. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. And Jimmy Simpson, who plays Mary Lightly in Psych, has a very reoccurring character on It's Always Sunny. And he's also a creepy guy on, like, on Sunny. Like, he, he plays the same sort of weird character. <laughs> and it's, it's so perfect. He's so good at it. I love his trench coat in this scene. But I think he, <laughs> this character just has such good timing as, like, a weirdo. It, like he plays it perfectly straight but also like over the top it's just I, I you rarely see that done so well yeah and he he can just do it like it it just flows so perfectly and there I don't I don't understand how they're not laughing the entire time Mary is oh the outtakes I'm for sure this episode I'm sure any episode must be gold yeah so we cut to the deluxe modern burger. It's a it's an old-fashioned diner. And when we enter the diner, they're sitting in a booth and Mary's like, and I was nine years old when Mother gave me my first haircut. <laughs> <laughs> the, the waitress comes up. She calls Gus Dollface and gives him a milkshake. It's a glass of milk, I think, which is another allusion to... Jimmy Simpson Simpson's character on on Philly uh, on yeah. Sunny he he and his people only drink milk and there the episode <laughs> where his character gets married somebody like spikes the milk with some sort of hallucinogenic drug and they all turn into like essentially zombies and it's a funny it's a funny disgusting hilarious show and I guess Jimmy Simpson and Charlie Day were are, are really really good buddies like, they lived together for a while, and they did things together for a while, so. Oh, that's really fun. Go. So, Sean wants to know why why Mary really brought them here. What's, what's on his mind? He pulls out Yang's book. I assume you've read this. <laughs> oh, my gosh. 
they go through this whole thing where Sean is like, Reddit, I, I'm going to just paraphrase here, but I believe I'm introduced on page 11 as, do you have this, you have the quote? Right? As a thick tufted boy genius who skates through life on a poly, on polished blades of snarky elegance. Mary is like, underwhelmingly pleased. He goes, that's an exact quote, Sean. And <laughs> Gus is like, yeah, do you remember what I was described as? Laughing on the outside, crying on the inside. The farsiduous eyebrow, farsiduous? Fastidious wrinkle in the brow of psych. There it is. She also said that my- Sean says, Sean says, yeah, but she also said that you had skin of pure cocoa velvetiness. The name of, Ga- of Yang's book, just, just want to get it out there, is Yang the Whole Story, From Serial Dater to Serial Killer. I have another theory about I, this. Well, there's also something underneath I it. I couldn't read that. What did it say? It says, how murder kept me skinny. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Cosmo cover. Like, <laughs> I think it's just nonsense. I have, I have a theory. <laughs> we need to come back to it at the end. Uh, but, yeah. Okay. Um, Mary's like... She could not have done this alone. There's too much stuff that was going on. There's no way Yang could have done it without a partner. Well, yeah, Mary says, you're the only other person who understands Yang the way I understand Yang. And you must know that none of this, holding up the book, is possible. And Mary goes, like, for instance, the projectionist at the drive-in, like, the timing does not line up. Like, this isn't possible. They had to have help. Yang kind of, nope, Sean kind of thinks that Mary is projecting because he's given up his love, which was working on the Yang case. But he was all like, Yang wasn't working alone. And Sean tells him to go home. But Mary says, I am home. And I, for real, because of who this character is, was like, does he live in the diary? That's what I thought too. But no, he means he just, after the last Yang piece of case, he moved to Santa Barbara. So, like, he lives in the city. He never left. He's been here all year. Sean and Gus have a mumble fight. And then they decide that they're <laughs> that they're going to leave. And Mary said, don't go, Sean. You will regret it. And grabs oh, his he arm. He creepily grabs Sean by the arm. Yeah. And Sean is like, Good luck on your entry in the creepily grabbing arms contest this year. I think you have a real shot at winning. They leave. Mary starts eating his pie. But first he sticks the knife through his fork because who he eats a, a pie with fork and knife. And then pulls them down to the pie together and, and cuts his pie. And everything about Mary in that scene messes me up. It's a cherry pie, <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> at the psych office sean gets out the book and it looks like maybe he hasn't actually inscribed. read it i think i think he's like i just wrote in for the reread um he pulls it out and it's inscribed and it's like to sean i could never have done this without you xoxo and uh, like he settles in and we see right by him on the desk is a calendar of february Okay, this is important because I have a bone to pick with a later, a later scene. <laughs> but apparently it is February and February 24th is circled on the calendar. If we remember, February 24th was the day that Abigail said she was coming back to town briefly. <laughs> Sean gets a phone call. It's Chief Vic. Wakes him up. <laughs> they, he, he runs to wherever it is and Chief Vic is like... Yeah, the blueberry's driving... And then we're just on scene with, with Chief Vic, who I feel like, like, wasn't in most of the season and I'm still salty yeah, about it. Yeah, agreed. She's like, something has happened. Someone was strangled and essentially just dropped here. But we can't figure yeah, out who she is. eyes on it. Yeah, we need, we need psychicness on it while it's still fresh, whatever you can get. Um, we get white female strangled, mid-40s, literally dropped on the scene, like, sh- She's still warm. Um, and we see it's a blonde lady, and the boys are shook. This was the waitress from the diner yesterday. 
And she's been strangled by a man's tie. Is that a Hitchcock reference? Oh, it is. We hear that later. Yeah, we literally, we, we cover it um, a little bit later, but Sean is psyching out super hard. He's trying to get everything he can from the scene. He psychs in on some rocks and then it pans up. He just looks up and we view the scene from above and her body and the rocks around her are in a yin yang symbol, like a really subtle one mm-hmm. by all accounts, but. But for oh, our effects, so they fill it in. And then we go to credits. Um, we go back to the diner and here's Mary. <laughs> Sean is standing in the corner of the pie shop on one of the booths like a statue. I can't figure out why, but he is. He's just, you know, taking in the scene again. Apparently we learned that Mary was the, one of the last customers of the night. And they want to know that what he, like what he saw or noticed and he said after, you know, Gus and Sean left, um, well, after she delivered G- Gus's milk, they, he never saw her again, not even to pay the bill. And, and Gus is like, well, what happened to my $20 that I left? He made it into a hat for a special friend. <laughs> so Sean is psyching out and he sees a very faint yin yang symbol on a pie under a glass. And it's a very heavily laden meringue pie. I am offended by meringue pies that are 90% meringue. Yeah, less is more, I agree. When it comes to meringue, I I want I want nothing nothing less than a 50-50. Um I ideally I'd like a like a 30 meringue 60 filling 5 crust, 10 crust. That would be my goal. Here's the thing, any pie with meringue on it doesn't require meringue to be a good pie. <laughs> I'm going to die on that. That's hill. actually. But I get it. It makes it look, it looks some kind of way. It can be pretty. I also. But it's not necessary. It's just like sugar on top. And I love that. I'm not a big egg person anymore. Oh, that's fair. So. Okay. I'm definitely going to leave it, but give me a lemon pie, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Mary also sees the symbol and goes, this is the work of yin. And then he uses his hands to dig through the pie where he finds a note that says, I just wrote Mary in the pie. Um. It's a it's this week's cross crossword puzzle, and they're they're There's a highlight trying section. to figure out wh- what to look for, and then Sean remembers where he was sitting in the. Am I moving forward too well, far? Well, you're skipping ahead. Okay. Yeah. Twelve down, six across. So it's this week's. This week's crossword puzzle, the highlighted portions, uh, the clues read, a good man is hard to blank, blank myself and I. So Buzz comes in with the solve. (laughs) He just like, is like, I've got it. A good man is hard to find. Me, myself, and I. The answer is find me. And they're like, awesome work. (laughs) Juliet is like ready to go, but Sean stops her. He does not want to engage. He's pretty much worried that another killing spree is going to start just like it did last time. Oh yeah, it only leads to more bodies. He's like, we're not playing his game. We we play his game and people die. And Lasser's like, must be nice not to have to follow up on a murder investigation. So Sean is like, we're going straight to the source. You coming? To Mary. <laughs> There's a nice smile from Mary because he feels included. And we are in a very, very white room that they tell us is solitary confinement within a mental institution. And everybody is also wearing white because they are worried that the color is too much stimuli for Yang. Gus is like, uh, what about my face? We walk up and Yang says, Sean... I knew you'd come. She is so jazzed to see him. But then she's also... And the guard just... Yeah, she's kind of like creepy hitting on the the nurse guard that they're playing hard to get or something. And then asks about the She says, I've got the googly eyes for her. But she's playing hard to get. That's (laughs) it. They ask... or, Or, I'm sorry, Yang asks if Sean has read the book. And his response was, Honestly, I thought Bruce Campbell's was better. This was in my fun facts because later on, Bruce Campbell of the Evil Dead series is a guest Season star. Season 8, episode 9, show. yep. 
Sean only has one question for Yang. Yes, Sean. And Yang says They yes. allow conjugal <laughs> visits, but I think we'd have to get married first. <laughs> Gus thinks that's the most disgusting thing he's ever seen or heard, but Mary says, I am a fully ordained minister. Pause. <laughs> Is Mary kind of in love with Yang? Mary is a little obsessed with Yang, but he's willing to marry Yang off to Sean, so I don't think it's love. <laughs> and I don't think he mistakes it for love. I, I, I took it as, in a, in a very kind of gross way, like he was getting his jollies thinking about her getting it. I did not go there. I, I don't know why, but... Everything about Mary being so creepy and weird and so dedicated to learning about Yang, it was like, oh. I think he simps for her hard. I think it's, I yeah. can be of service in this oh, okay. moment. Okay. Let me. Not. Not. Woo-hoo. Yeah. That's what I. <laughs> if you will. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think he is, I don't find him to... <laughs> I don't think he's a sexual person <laughs> in that in that conventional way. I think that could I think be true. too weird. <laughs> they ask her if she has a partner. Oh, yeah. Sean spouts the theory of a partner, and Mary says, actually, I'm completely sure of it. And Yang is like, oh, are you? Are you, you Mary quite contrary? Are you now? She comes up to the glass, and they make extended eye contact and he sort of just like mild smile and eye contact like crazy (laughs) love and she's like i think we can help this isn't silence of the lambs okay gus says it totally that makes you frankie face on face on (laughs) fine yeah (laughs) we'll catch him yeah, Sean says we'll catch him without you. We don't need to help you. They're getting ready to leave and Yang gets quite mad and then finally agrees. She never said she didn't have a dance partner. So there really is a yin to her yang. And she says, if you think I'm sick, you haven't seen anything yet. That's not a... Because <laughs> she's... Yeah, yeah. Super dark. <laughs> they decide to retrace their steps and head back to the theater. It was a triple feature. But while Sean's standing there, they're all down by the screen. And Sean walks up the aisle, and then he puts it together. Well, down. Public. Six across. So he counts up the seats, and he goes, right there, right there. And Gus is like, I think this was our row. They ask Sean if he remembers what he looked like, and he said no, he had a hat on. But they do still find Um, a note that says, Oh, Sean, don't cry over spilt soda, but tisk tisk, tisk, you were 20 minutes late, and now you have to play catch up. So Lassie's like, go back to Yang. And Mary's like, no, she is not in charge. Or like, yeah, she's not leading this Yin is working alone. There is no game. It's the law of opposites. Yin, or Yang, Yang had rules and games, and Yin has chaos. Um, he says, as soon as you think you figure out the rules, guaranteed, they'll change. And Gus is like, but this is movies. This is the movies. And Laster is fully fed up. But Gus is like, no, 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 no. The necktie that strangled the waitress, that's straight out of Frenzy. It's all themes and motifs. That's the clues. They're in the Hitchcock films. Mary said, that's very good, Gustus. (laughs) Gus's face... (laughs) Gustus? <laughs> That's one of my favorite Gus names. So Sean is like, okay. Sean does this thing where he assigns them runs of movies, but the movies he's naming are <laughs> Reynolds movies. So I didn't write any of them down because Gus calls him out on it and Sean's like, well, I guess we better get started then. <laughs> Gus and I will take the Cannonball Run series. Mary, you take Hooper through Stalker. Str- 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 Mary, you take Hooper through Stroker Ace. And then those are Bart Reynolds movies. We clip to the movie. So they, they've got their assignment. I don't know what they're watching, but it's obviously a Hitchcock movie. You probably knew what they were watching. Sean's watching Vertigo and he has fallen asleep. The screen zooms out to him and Henry, and, and we can kind of tell that he's dreaming because the first thing we see is Henry in like an old school movie theater usher's outfit theater boy. 
usher. That's the word I couldn't think of. I was just like, Henry's the theater boy. <laughs> Henry's saying to him, you can pick up on something. You saw something, not his face, but think, Sean, think. There's a whole Juliet in the shower scene. Of course there is. Psycho. And she's like in the throes of the dying in the shower scene. And she's like, his feet. <laughs> Come on, Sean. Lassiter is an angry old lady. He's he's the Norman dressed up like his mom from Psycho. And he's like, Spencer, I'm cold. Hurry up. We don't have all night. John starts to remember <laughs> all of the people from the movies. And then he gets to where Yin was in his, in his memory and leans over to see that he has on ankle weights. Um, and then his dream vision goes to a dream version of Mary. And he's like, come on, Sean. It's me. It's always been me. He starts to remember all the times that Mary kind of, quote, knew things that nobody else knew. And then he hears, Sean, wake up. Sean, Sean. And it's Gus waking him up because somebody wrote on their window. And now Psyche says, Psycho. And Sean thinks he know who, knows who Yin is. Good Psycho. I mean, we've said Psycho enough times, but I think the whole point of that was to... Get Psycho into the episode a bunch, since we're the Psychos. That's my theory. We're the Psychos. <laughs> at, <I know. laughs> yeah, we have said Psycho a lot. Like at that. Chief Fix's office, Sean is trying to convince them that it was Mary. This is outlandish. And why are you coming at us with this accusation right now? Why not a year ago? Juliet remembers that that was the first thing that Sean said when he met Mary. That was the, the original tag. But... Lassie says, you were just being flippant and jackassy. Like, that wasn't psychicness. <laughs> Gus said, fine. Um, we'll either do it together or we'll do it alone. It's up to you. Yeah, he says, based on our track record, this should be enough for you. Like, if we don't do this all together, we'll just follow you guys around and do our own investigation along the way. Like, usual. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Vic agrees, but reminds them that they have absolutely no evidence, and so they need to figure out what to do. And Sean suggests that they do nothing. Um, Laster says that's very Seinfeldian, which is a famous play on the fact that it's a show about nothing. Also, uh, Tim's first on-screen credit was in Seinfeld. Oh yeah, wasn't he George's Susan's brother or something? I don't know. <laughs> anyway. The plan is to keep him close, play along, and catch him red-handed. Let him hang himself. So Mary... Knocks on the window, scaring everyone. Creepy Mary in the window with <laughs> the next clue. In. He says, this clue was left on my doorstep with Matisse Galago sardines in olive oil. It took every ounce of willpower he had not to open those babies <laughs> up. The clue says, take 39 steps by 1205. Wait for it. Coordinated north by northwest, make a wish. Coordinates north by Coordinates. northwest. Coordinates. North by Northwest, make a wish. Chief is like, what? And Mary's like, it's all motifs. You got to think through it, Chief. And Lassiter, in a very smooth move, is like, well, we're all ears. Is like egging Mary on. You really are all ears, Carlton, aren't um, you? Jewel starts spectacular. spouting. Oh, spectacular. But Jewel starts going, all right. Northwest this, Northwest that, Northwest Park and Picnic. Gus plays dominoes down there with some Jamaicans on Sundays. He plays chess, honey. Chess. Why did I straight up wrote dominoes? <laughs> I have no idea. But he plays chess with some Jamaicans. And I was like, how impressive, Guster. I don't, I don't think we've seen you play chess. <laughs> There's a penny fountain there. Hence the make-a-wish. And stairs. So... Uh, they're all gung-ho, they're going to go to the park, they're going to do the thing, because time is a ticking, and Sean and Gus sort of hang back, and they're like, oh, we'll we'll meet you guys there, and we're going to take the blueberry, blah, blah. They kind of go on a detour, and this is where I want to remind everyone that this is supposed to be February in California, and we're driving down a suburban street with blazing orange fall foliage. <laughs> That bothered me so bad. Like, it's gorgeous, but it's not February. <laughs> the house is very creepy. And as soon as they get in, they see, dude, it's Ben. And, <laughs> and a kitchen full of 
sardine cans, both opened, emptied, partially emptied, and ready to be eaten. Like ugh. Ben is the rat from the last Yin Yang episode, and he is wearing the hat made of the twenty dollar bill from Gus. Yeah, he wasn't kidding. <laughs> Um, there are creepy numbers written all around the top of the walls, and Sean is like, what is with the numbers? Gus realizes that it's pi. To an extreme yes. amount of decimal points. Um, we get a, Gus, don't be, Co- don't be Topher Grace running on the beach at the end of Good Company. And then <laughs> Gus said. Um, in Good Company, yeah. Do we like pie, he asks. <laughs> I just found that very funny. <laughs> Um, now we cut to the cops at the park with Mary in tow, and they're running across a field. Suddenly, Laster is being chased by a plane, a la, um, this is, oh my god, what is his name? Anyway, it's from the movie North by Northwest, and it turns out to be a toy plane, um, and Laster wants them to arrest that fat kid, (laughs) but, um... Mary's getting a thigh spasm, and the cops don't wait for him. They run up the stairs, and Juliet's counting as they go. The then, the 39 steps was a reference to something, but I don't... In the movie, the 39 okay. steps. Back at, the, back at Mary's, Gus finds ticket stubs for the theater that Sean and Gus were at. And Sean finds a, um, like, shrine? uh, shrine's a great word. For um, him in one of Mary's closet. Yeah, it's like essentially the last time they were all working on this case in Santa Barbara. It's all like pictures of and paraphernalia from that and a huge postery picture of Sean. And then we cut back to Lassie and Jules on the steps and it's 12.05 and they're at the top and they see a bus line and Jules says, oh my gosh, that is the North Line. They see a man with a hat getting on the bus and then they're like, wait. Where's Mary? Right there at the top of the steps. They're right next to that wishing fountain that Gus was talking to earlier. And the top of that fountain has a pineapple on it. Um, back to Sean and Gus. Uh, there's a notebook. There's an address and a time and a new clue. And Gus said, or Sean says, this is the rough draft. It. I was totally right. This confirms it. Like he he was planning out his next his next clue and gus is like well who's it for it's for his next victim so the clue said it's time we meet in the flesh don't you think um and then there's a address and and it says curtains at nine come alone so then we're back to lassie and jules are headed to their car and then mary runs up um lassiter's just getting off the phone he is so mad at poor buzz mary's because buzz couldn't find anything yeah poor buzz Well, apparently he got off at the next stop, um, and they couldn't find anything. So Mary runs up all out of breath, and he's like, Did you see him at the bus? I tried to stop him. He totally manhandled me. I lost my shoe. (laughs) And he's very pleased about all of this. (laughs) Lassiter also manhandles him. He does. Sean, Gus, Lassiter, and Juliet are all in a car outside of the... 736 address that Sean and Gus had found at Mary's house. And they're like, are you sure about this? Nothing's happening. And Sean is like, this is the clearest vision I've had in years. I saw Mary. I saw this address. I blah, blah, blah. And then Mary rides up on his Vespa. He goes inside and they go, it's showtime. And Lassiter tells them to stay in the car, which... I don't even know why he tries anymore. So they're standing on either side of the door and they're talking about how it's probably watched. It's probably locked. They need to go around the perimeter, find alternative ways into the building. And then Sean and Gus are just leaning up against the door or against the side talking to them. Uh, and they were like, I thought we told you to stay in the car. Now, correct me, Kaylee, because I'm certain I'm incorrect. But was that? A, a pseudo a pseudo duplicate of the cover of the breakfast club and just the way sean and gus were standing it reminded me I, I don't know for some reason that's what came to mind for me i didn't look it up i probably should have i was kind of expecting you to be like no alexis you're dumb but oh my god i i didn't notice well enough to know i, I want to compare the pictures now okay definitely wasn't the breakfast club 
cover. Let's try 16 Candles. But Ali Sheedy wasn't in 16 Candles. No. Okay. Well, never mind. (laughs) I'll cut or you'll cut all this out. Uh, Because I don't know what episode we're on. Okay. So, yeah, they tell the boys to wait in the car and to, you know, signal if they see anything at this door. They need to keep eyes on it. So they take off on either side of the building, and Sean proceeds to break into the door they just left. And Gus grabs the pipe as protection. So they walk in, and they're in a room, and there are video screens everywhere, and then they see Mary on one of the screens as they're watching. And they're kind of enclosed. They don't really see a way out of this room. The door. But this is the way that Mary went in. The door is now locked. They can't get out. And Mary is walking around going, come out, come out wherever you are. Yeah, it's like creepy. We don't really know what's going on yet. And then um, Mary's on the steps. He's walking up them kind of slowly. Sean's getting flashes. We're getting flashes. This is an exact scene from Psycho. Spoiler alert, Mary's not being the bad guy in Psycho in this scene. This is Psycho. We were wrong. Mary's the victim. Mary, Mary, get out of here. And um, it's just like the detective in Psycho, um, the, the masked hatted man, like, appears at the top of the stairs, stabs Mary. Mary falls backwards, walking down the stairs as he goes, just like the scene from Psycho. And then he falls. The boys find a crack in the wall. They, they run out. They run to him. It's terrible, and I hate everything about it. The clue wasn't meant to be written by him. It was meant for him. And everything they saw were recreations, not first drafts. Mary was the one who had because gotten called a weirdo. to the scene. But don't worry, because Mary so... brought a gun. <laughs> but it's a flare gun, just like in Breakfast Club with the nerd. And need we remind you that Ali Sheedy was in the Breakfast Club. So all of this kind of fits. Gus sees Yin and starts chasing him, but... Sean stays back with Mary. Yeah, Mary's like, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you guys. I wanted to be heroic. Could you take care of Ben? Sean, do you think they have racquetball in heaven? I don't want to talk about it. (laughs) That's not what Sean says. Sean says, I know they do. (laughs) Mary smiles. Mary dies. I said it, so you didn't have to. Lassie and Jules are unable to catch anyone because they ran after who Gus was directing them to. Gus didn't run with them. He stayed in the room, but Sean was the one, like, side by side with Mary. We're done with the scene. I can't talk about it. I can't talk about it. But I, it's worth putting out there that although Mary may no longer be with us in this episode, we do get more Mary again. Yeah. I mean. We do. It, they could it weird like, but we they do. could not have this character recur <laughs> it is weird and this is why Sean is psychic <laughs> he's not always right but he's psychic <laughs> they go back to see Yang again and she's playing with a like a big old red yoga ball and yet we couldn't have Gus's face because the color would overstimulate her I don't know Yeah, she's like, this is my exercise time. You're interrupting it. Besides this, the only other joy I have in this place is my shock therapy. She kind of throws the ball and then she screams, roll it back, Reginald. Who is she talking to? (laughs) Sean was wrong about Mary. And and he tells Yang. And Yang said, the guy creeped me out. I know. But in your defense, he was super creepy. (laughs) That was an honest mistake. And then she tells them... Gus says, help us. She has already given them all the clues that they need. Never judge a book by its cover, no matter how sexy that picture might be. Sean's like, the cover? The cover? And then he takes the book, and he rips off the cover, and he holds it up to the light, and it reveals like a little doodle of a girl. And Gus is like, oh? (laughs) Okay? Oh, look, she drew you a self-portrait. (laughs) <laughs> they get a phone call from Chief, and there's been another clue. There is an address that they are to be at at 9 p.m. He has created his own movie set. Lassiter's like, I'm not watching another one of these movies. And um, she said, well, don't worry, because you are the movie. 
He wants all of you at his movie set, and he has cast you as characters. And she goes through these slides that are part of the clue. Um, we should say the first thing is a fake, like, spec script page. And I took a picture of it. Ooh. It says, <clears throat> it says, exterior, Hitchcock City, nighttime. It's seemingly deserted. I can't read all of it because there's stuff over it, but something, uh, death and intrigue lurk at every turn. It's careful because even the picturesque lamppost could be a clue. We see our group, in all, all caps, enter in a stunning noir tableau. Jimmy Stewart, Canada Lee, Kim Novak, Rod Taylor, Sean Connery. Juliet O'Hara looking especially the femme fatale. They all turn on their flashlights. Is that, does it really say that? It does. So, okay. So I took a picture of this. At this point, I'm so mad at the SBPD because as soon as I saw this page that says all of these things and his fake like script page with all of our cast listed, the only person whose actual name is used anywhere on this page is Juliet O'Hara. Second of all, all of these people, if we've been deep diving into Hitchcock to try and figure out at least some kind of a rule, if, if Yin has any, I'm looking at what movies these people were all in. Jimmy Stewart was in more than one Hitchcock film, but whether it's Vertigo or Rear Window, he lives till the end. Canada Lee was in Lifeboat. He lives to the end. Kim Novak, Vertigo. She doesn't live to the end. Bum, bum, bum. Um, Rod Taylor is in The Birds. Sean Connery is in Marnie. All of these people live except Kim Novak, and Juliet O'Hara is named. So they're cast thusly. Lassie is Rod Taylor from The Birds. Sean is Jimmy Stewart from Rear Window. Jules is Kim Novak, OBS. Gus is Canada Lee from Lifeboat. And Chief says, we have a chance to catch him. We'll have a team at the perimeter. Y'all have to go on set like he wants. And Lester's like, snipers? Of course there'll be snipers. You bet your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Henry walks in and he's just like, hey, what can I do? You called me. What's up? We find out that he's been cast. As Sean Connery. He's not super upset by the casting, <laughs> but Sean is like, dad, you can say no. I'm going to be right by your side, son. End of discussion. Chief is like, this ends tonight. Tonight. They're at a big so warehouse set thing. And they're all ready to go. They all have their little earpieces in so that they can talk to the people on the outside. And there is a... And everybody has flashlights, just like the script said. <laughs> there... I cannot believe that's what the script said. I'm so baffled by that. There is a car to the side and the lights flash on. And Len... Lenry, that's Lassiter and Henry. Lenry <laughs> think that the car is for, for either of them. So they both go to check it out. Um, yeah, we don't have time for this. You both go. And then um, there's a note under the windshield. It just says, need, need a, a ride? ride. It's a Cadillac. It's super old looking. They both get in and they're like, it looks clear. So the next thing is Sean sees a wheelchair by the window. And that's from Rear Window with Jimmy Stewart. So he's like, <laughs> just like an extended Jimmy Stewart impression. And they're just <laughs> like, yeah, okay, go. <laughs> Gus and Juliet are still confused where they're supposed to go, but um, they see a life ring, and Gus is like, well, I guess that's my part. Yeah, the life preserver on the door. I just wrote, we're splitting up? That's a terrible idea. That's like, that's like 101, right? Murder movie 101, you stick together, but okay. <laughs> so, anyway... <laughs> Sean is up in the window. He can see everything. This is rear window, so he can see everybody. And um, Gus is like, what am I supposed to do? Open and <laughs> Sean is like, okay, here's what you do. Open the door and then run. <laughs> <laughs> but it's locked. Juliet is now so... alone. And um, a light turns on at the bar that says Ernie's. And they're like, oh, that must be for you, Juliet. Yeah, it's the bar from Vertigo. So... Henry and Lassie are in this car, and there starts to be, like, movie driving footage playing behind them as if they were driving the movie in the car, or driving the car in the movies. Oh, my God. The door's locked. looking around, and the locks, yeah, the locks engage, and Jules goes into the bar, 
and then there's a really loud sound over all their earpieces. It's the it's the sound from that movie that was playing, and it's basically like horns blaring, and now nobody can talk to one another. And Gus is like, oh no, we can't see Juliet, we can't talk to Juliet, we need to find her. So he runs into the bar, and she's like, stop, stop, stop! So she's behind the bar, and he's like in the entry, essentially. And... She's like, don't move. I found a clue. It says, draft us a couple cold ones and let's make a toast to you fallen head over heels for me. Okay, first of all, you're Kim Novak in Vertigo. She falls out of a bell tower and dies at the end. Like, don't do what this man is telling you to do. (laughs) He's literally telling you he wants to have you fall head over heels for him. Nobody is thinking this through. Yeah, none of this makes sense. They're playing a Yang game right now, but it's not Yang. Like, they're following all the rules because that's how it worked with Yang, but we were told very early on that that's not how it's going to work with Yin. It's going to be the opposite. And it's super obvious if they do the least little bit of due diligence. Like, he he doesn't have anybody else. Nobody else is missing. Nobody else is murdered. Like... He's gunning for Juliet. It's so clear. I'm so angry. Yeah. I'm so angry. Gus is a little bit worried, just like Kaylee is, but Juliet pulls the draft to to pour a beer. A trap door opens below her, and she drops through the floor. Gus runs over, Gus? and um, she dropped her gun along the way. He immediately picks it up and jumps down the hole to follow her. Go, Gus. And she is nowhere to be found. The car stops being crazy. They're chasing things. They're chasing, they're chasing, they're screaming for Juliet, but they, there's nothing. Yeah, Gus is in the tunnels, but Juliet is gone. They're at the Santa Barbara Police Department waiting for the call from Juliet. Uh, we hear Bolo out for Juliet O'Hara and suspect, considered armed and dangerous. Everyone's in shock. Henry, Buzz, Gus, Lassiter are all freaking out. And Chief Vic is like, we're just waiting for the call. Sean completely blames himself for her going missing. And Chief is like, that tunnel wasn't on the schematic. No, we we couldn't have known that it was there. And Sean's like, unless you were psychic. But I mean, we were all blinded by the movie set of it Mm -hmm. all. Like every single one of us. And... (sighs) Henry walks in. He was on the phone. With Madeline. He said, I just... And he says, she's good. I wanted to let her know that you were safe. She's in New York at a conference. No worries. And then we get a, hey, isn't Abigail coming in tonight? Oh, yeah. She's landing from 30 minutes from now. Oh, my God. It's the 24th. So Shonda's like, oh, I got to go. I got to go. And (laughs) Chief is like, no, no. We need you here. This call could come in at any moment. We'll send someone for her. Somebody she knows. Like Buzz. And she screams for McNabb. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Buzz is picking her up and she's like, where is Sean? What's going on? Buzz plays the good cop. I cannot tell you what's going on. He puts her in. here for your safety. And she's like, my safety? And she's like, I'm just following orders. And he calls her. Miss Lytar. Miss Lytar. And she's very taken aback. So she gets in the car and she's like, whatever. And then I just wrote, oh no, Buzz. Because Buzz. Well, it- For a split second, this has been tricking us to see whether we thought that Buzz was in on something. Yeah, because he was just sitting there staring at the SBPD. And then he looks at her when she's in the back seat of his cruiser and kind of like slowly turns his head sideways. And she's like, Buzz, what the crap? And (laughs) then he falls over. There's just a dude with a needle. He jumps into the front seat, he sprays her, and Abigail is out. I mean, to her credit, she was screaming immediately, like, for Buzz, for herself. Um, But yes, he sprayed something at her. They gone. Sean gets a call from Abigail's phone and is very excited, but it is not Abigail. Man voice, man voice! Our femme fatale is still alive. They're both so you. I must... Oh, no, no. Oh, please. I've got good news and bad news. The good news is that our femme fatale is still very much alive. The bad news 
I've now met the girl next door. I understand your predicament. They're just both so you. Um, I'm making this sound more fun than it is. He doesn't inflect at all. He's not fun like Yang. Um, <laughs> I was just listening and I was like, you sound so much like Yang right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, he says, Sean, but you can't have your cake and eat it too. I'm actually doing you a favor by forcing you to choose. Who do you care about more? Because you can't save them both. Son of a bitch! <laughs> I hate him so much. Good news. Buzz is okay. Thank goodness. This is the third time that Buzz has almost died. I don't like yes. it. Yes. Oh my god. Oh my god. Well, the good news is, spoiler alert, he's alive in the movies. So <laughs> we don't have to worry that much, but poor Buzz mm. has been through it. He, however, did not see Yin. Um, Gus is trying to sh cheer Sean up with bugles, which is like the most genuine thing ever. But it doesn't work. Sean's little heart the is broken until Juliet calls. Sean answers and he's like, what? What is it? What's the clue? It is Juliet speaking. And she said, Sean, I'll drop by half past four. My hands are on my face. Please come quick or things could be messy. And then Juliet tries really, really quickly to be like, you can still save her. You can save her. And then hangs up really quickly. Um, and then we see... That Juliet is gagged and tied up at a clock tower and tethered to the clock tower. Mr. Yin lights a spark and sparks the wire from the clock that will be released just as the minute hand hits the six or half past four. So Gus is like, my hands are on my face. It's a clock. There's a clock. And Lester's like, Kim Novak and Vertigo. That was a bell tower. This is a clock tower. Chief is like, drop by. Drop Bye. Lassiter is ready to go, but Chief Dick stops him because Abigail is a civilian and she has to take priority. Um, with all due respect, you have other units. I'm going to get my partner now. Go, Lassie. So Chief is like, Sean, where's Abigail? What have you got? What are we doing here? And Sean is like, I have no idea. We can't save them both and we know where Juliet is. Good. Get on Jules. Chief Vic agrees, and she starts trying to send Henry home. And Henry's like, nope, didn't you just offer me a job? I'll take it. Yeah, he, and he's accepting the job to get in on this. So they're kind of like walking and arguing, and Sean goes to Gus, wait, 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 wait. The Yang drawing. It wasn't a self-portrait. It wasn't Yang. I think it was Abigail on the pier the, the first time we were supposed to have a date, and I stood her up. Gus is ready to go, but Sean stops him and says, Gus, the only way I cannot be there for Juliet is to know that you are, and I won't be alone. Gus gives him the nod, and the very next thing we see is Sean and Henry running down the pier. God, so Henry, they, they get there, and Sean is like, boats, and Henry's running ahead, and then Sean kind of senses movement, and he turns, and he's almost face-to-face -face with the masked man, who has a huge hunk of rope thrown over his shoulder. Yin kind of, after staring at Sean, glances and looks at what we later find out is where Abigail is, and Sean said, Sean basically she's says, under the pier, isn't she? And so... At this point, he could either dive for this man or go save his girl. So he, like, runs down the pier. And then he finds where Abigail is underneath, and he peers through the cracks at her, and he's like, I'm here. It's going to be fine. And he takes his phone out of his pocket, and then he tells her, because she's gagged, to blink once for yes and two for no if there are any explosives that he can trigger by coming down there. And it's a no, so it's all clear. And he jumps off the pier. Like, it's action mode. We cut to the tower where the rest of the brigade is going after Juliet. And they find out that the elevator is out of order. They start running up the steps. And then we cut quickly back to the pier. Um, Sean's with Abigail. Henry's up on the pier. He's found where Sean's gone. Um, Sean is like, Dad, do you still have your Swiss? And Henry's like... I'm the one who taught you that. So we finally get an explanation on why Sean always has a Swiss army knife. Like it has come up so much. It's, it's such a good character trait for 
John and and to find out that he found it from Hen to find out that he learned it from Henry, although we don't learn it in a flashback, is like such a good moment. I don't know. I feel so great about that. Um, there's also some jokes while while Sean is under the water, um, like we've really come full circle, huh? This is where I stood you up for the first for our first date. And Abigail goes, "Thanks for showing up this time." Thanks for co- yeah. And he's going underwater to start cutting her ropes with his knife, and he's like, "Don't worry, I won't try anything while I'm down there." <laughs> Uh, He also tells Henry to, come on in, the water's great. Yeah, Henry jumps off the pier too. Um, Back to the clock tower, the clock is ticking down, Lassie and Gus get up there just in time, they, you know, touch the tether. Well, they're running running up the steps first, and I I only want to bring that up because, um, is that a... they're they're circular steps that they're running up and there's yellow on them and i i thought that that was probably a reference to a hitchcock movie but i didn't know i mean i don't know if because honestly i think everything vertigo was was in like such gray tones at some points that it just like but they they do go up on this bell tower multiple times and that's where the action is, is taking place and stuff but um so they get up to the top, they're in, in, within the clock, and then they go out and they see her and they touch the tether and it's like electrified, so they can't really do anything with that. But, um... Gus, Gus our genius. Needs, <laughs> Gus needs to hold the clock hand because it's about to strike the tether and, like, cause her to plummet. So he's holding it and he's like, Lassie, get on this, I can't hold it for long. Lassiter runs inside. Just as Lassiter is running inside, they get Abigail out of her ropes. And then Lassie, I love this. Lassiter puts his gun in the gears of the clock. Now, is that, if that's a movie reference, great. If not, I'm so proud of Lassiter for using his gun to help Juliet without shooting something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's running in there, like, with his gun. You you think he's going to start shooting things, but instead he jams the gears. Like, he breaks it with his gun without shooting it. And I, like, I don't know, maybe he sacrifices his gun to do that. They go, we got you, and they, they get Juliet, and, and, and we're, we're good. Gus and Sean are on the phone. We find out that both of the girls are safe. And uh, Sean tells Gus... I saw him. I was face to face with the monster. But I had to let him go. Gus said, you did the right thing. So this game is not over. Like they, they saved them. They got everybody out, but they did not win. You know what I mean? Like the bad guy's not caught. This psycho is still out there. Henry comes up and there's a very nice Henry Sean hug. And Henry said, listen, you take care of your girl. I'll take care of the cops. How about the Swiss, huh? And they're like, oh, yeah. But apparently Henry means they switched up their knives at some point. So they have to exchange their Swiss army knives. And Sean said, look at that. Yours is so much bigger than mine. <laughs> so That's not such a weird father-son moment. Not only is that a wonderful penis joke, but it's a penis joke straight out of Spaceballs, which I appreciated. <laughs> so we're with sean and abigail on the pier and sean is like maybe this is just a gut reaction to everything we've just been through but us being here back on this pier it, it means something what if what if i'm willing to learn to compromise to meet you halfway on absolutely everything abigail would really like that but she has so much to do. She has so much to see and so much to learn. And she can't do it if she's dead. She says he makes her laugh. And she feels like she's a little bit crazy. And if she lets herself, she'd fall completely. Like, she's on this precipice. But, like, she wants to inspire people. She wants to make big changes and make things happen. And Sean's like, well, inspire you inspire me. me. And they kiss. Abs is like, I'm sorry. I just don't think I'm cut out for this. Call me if you decide to ever stop chasing psychopaths. 
Sean Sean tells her like it's okay and and I'm I'm sorry for like everything. So she leaves and it's just Sean alone on the pier. We should say this is her last appearance. Like we have closure on Abigail. We can we can take that to heart. Yep. We start a um we start a montage at this point. And the first the first um montage we see is Juliet still on top of the tower and she is very clearly telling everyone I'm okay. I don't want to talk about it. I'm fine. I'm okay. And she has like this like hard exterior face on. And then Lassiter comes over and she just breaks down. Like after screaming, I'm fine multiple times, we don't hear any of this, but you can read this clearly. Like every three words, it's I'm fine. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm really, I'm fine. And then she just cries into Lassie and it's just. Mm. You can tell how much in that moment, like how much Lassiter cares for Juliet as his partner, but also how much Juliet cares for him as a human like it's that's a very good moment this is this is the moment where i teared up not when mary died both yeah (laughs) they got me this episode i'm so mad (laughs) henry is at the psych window and he's taking the o off and he's fixing it sean and gus sean and gus they're at mary's funeral in their full white racquetball outfits and they put a racquetball paddle racket, <laughs> a pair of goggles and some balls onto his head or onto his um, coffin. There's a better word for coffin. What is it? It's it's not a coffin. It, it's a uh, uh, it's called something else. The modern ones. Yeah. The the squared ones. It's beautiful. They it, his... the the sad part though is that that nobody else is there besides one lady that we can assume was Mary's mom. Yeah, and she has very fluorescent orange hair, and there's a minister presiding. The next thing we see is Yang, very, very sad at the asylum, and then Yin at home, and he's looking at and kind of caressing this picture of Sean and, uh, well, of of Yang and little baby Sean. Yeah, he's still wearing his mask, but we see him remove his hat, and... Yeah, this picture it is it is it on a baby grand? Is it on a piano? It's on or just a table. It's on something. It's on something like hefty, and we get a like a flashback recording of Yang saying, "Oh, don't worry, Sean. I know we'll be working together again." And there are no like our theme song is not over the end credits. It's just it it goes from whatever song it was playing over this montage to just creepy music over the credits. That's it. That's how we end the season. Oh my gosh. It's it's not a happy ending. I mean No, because I, we saved our girls, but we didn't win. Justice did not prevail. No. No. Not at all. But that's that's yeah. That's it. Now, we will meet Yin again. We will see Mary again. We will not see Abigail again. We will see Yang again. We will see yeah, Henry yeah. in a working position soon. We will yeah. say see Juliet in a I'm fine, I'm better new flashy haircut. We will see another recap at the beginning of season five. I accidentally found out. And most importantly, Buzz is okay. So we'll see Buzz again. Buzz is okay. <laughs> we can take that to heart. These people have really been through it. I... <laughs> they really have. This season has been like, like my 2023. Mm. Madeline was tethered to a bomb. Juliet was strung up hanging from a clock tower. Like, the audacity of these villains. Question. Does Mm. Yin and or Yang ever go after a male? Or are they always female victims? You know, I don't remember the next Yin-Yang episode very well. I only remember certain parts. I don't know about the, because we, the thing with Yang is we know that Yang was a serial killer that was fairly prolific, but would come out of the woodwork every so often, killing one or two people, etc. I want to say there were some men in those groups, but I don't really remember. And that all happened off screen. That was just like, it feels like hearsay because we don't, there are very few actual murders. Right. 
right? Like, there's the hostess. Wait, did the hostess die in the Yang episode? Mm-hmm. And then the waitress died in this one. Whose name I I kept trying to see on her on her name tag and I didn't get her name. Oh. Well, then there but, was um, there was mom, there was Madeline, and then obviously Abigail and Juliet. Mm-hmm. And so I I so wonder. So unless it was like one of the past ones that they referenced, we don't see it yeah. yet. Or I guess I, I guess considering Sean is is their foe. In this scenario, they're playing to his heartstrings if you will and so that's why they're going after also, female victims also it's it's like the the reality of it is that that it most often re, the serial killers most often affect uh female uh victims yes yeah. bull bull crap i say not that male victims would be better but come on the misogyny <laughs> Well, we are going to take a recording break because it uh, happens to be the holiday season here. However, I don't know that you guys are going to get much of a playing break because we are, we've been taking breaks as we've needed them. And if this has been a wonderful addition to our recording schedule. Yeah. So I think you'll get this, you'll get this finale episode in the new year. Yes. I think so too. Yeah. Oh. Early, early in January, but it should be. Yeah. So happy new year <laughs> to any, uh, we'll be back eventually <laughs> to any blueberryian out there. Who's listening. Happy new year. <laughs> I am Alexis. Cut me some slack on the wardrobe. It's great to be back. And I'm Kaylee. I will not wear short pants, Sean. And this has been to, to the, the blueberry. blueberry psych out.